we've inherited a fortune. I'm talking about Grand Cayman's reef fish, but sadly we've uh, damaged it a bit. And these are our personal, private goose that lay the golden eggs. You remember how that story ends? Yeah, they ate the goose. But our golden eggs, our diving tourism, beautiful sandy beaches, and, uh, and free food for Caymanians. But we've reduced our reef fish population by well over 90% just the past 50 years. What little remains is going fast. We're doing the same thing to our reef fish that we did with the turtles. Now I'm gonna talk a little about how I think we got here, uh, why I think this is so urgent that we do something about it right now, and what I think we can do about it. And I do have hope that we can do something good about this really soon. Just to be clear, reef fish only live on the shallow reef shelf above 240 feet on up to shore. Uh, at the top of this picture, you see that dark blue right at the top edge. That's where it drops off from 100 feet straight down to 1,000 feet. They don't live down there. They don't live out in the deep open ocean. They don't cross the deep open ocean, right? They're limited to this narrow little strip we have around our island. It's a tiny little habitat they live in. There's no magic source of adult reef fish coming in from the deep as we fish them out. And pelagic fish like this wahoo, tuna, mahi-mahi, those are open water, deep water fish out there, which we're not talking about at all today. I grew up fishing and spear fishing in Newport Beach, California. I know the joy of learning how to fish from a seaworthy father, uh, which is you know, one of our biggest cultural traditions here in Cayman. But I traded in my spear gun for a camera and I've never eaten one reef fish in 32 years of living in Grand Cayman because when I arrived, it was already clearly evident that our reef fish were in rapid decline. That was 1983 and it started long before I got here. But we did have still a good number of friendly Nassau groupers like you see here. These are fearless fish. Uh, speaking of fearless today, these guys hang out with you, they follow you around, they get in your face, they're a great photo opportunity for divers and they're one of the greatest highlights of anybody's uh, dive visit to Cayman. We had big fish, we had big schools of fish, but I'd gotten here just in time to see all this before it all disappeared. All the dive masters and the repeat dive customers were already grumbling and moaning about how quickly it was going. You know, I got here just in time to make friends with some of these big fish before they disappeared too. But our greatest loss was undoubtedly uh, the near total loss of these friendly Nassau groupers. Uh, because we fished them en masse from their spawning grounds while they're trying to make babies. And we did this year after year until finally so few remain. You can't even make a picture like this in Grand Cayman anymore, really. I had to take my sister Stacy over to Little Cayman for this picture. Now, my good buddy Jim Hillam uh, made this awesome image of uh, grouper spawning in Little Cayman during the Grouper Moon Project a couple of years ago. This is what it would have looked like here in Grand Cayman, uh, what, back when we had huge numbers. Spawning grounds are simply where fish gather together briefly to mate, reproduce, then they go back to their homes around the reef. Lots of fish do this, not just the Nassau groupers. But finally, oh, by the way, fishing any species this way is basically genocide, right? You can see it's shooting fish in a barrel. You can wipe out an entire population in just a few days this way. And you're taking all the pregnant females with all their eggs. So, you know, it's, it's kind of disturbing to think how, how long it took for us to figure this out. But finally, in 2003, we banned fishing of the Nassau grouper spawning grounds. Just the Nassau grouper, that's not all the fish. Um, but it was a year too late for Grand Cayman. We'd already fished out almost all the mature Nassau groupers here, which is where this problem comes in. And at this point, we had two spawning grounds um, at, when we banned the fishing. And at this point now, 12 years later, one of the two spawning grounds remains empty to this day. Not a fish has returned. Now, in 2010, seven years after the, the ban, Finally, a small handful of maybe 500 Nassau groupers were sighted at the other spawning ground. So there's a ray of hope for these fish. But this requires that we really pay attention and care enough to protect these fish entirely. If we want to see a total return, we, we want to see what, what we used to have, which was roughly, well, what, probably well over 100,000 Nassau groupers in Grand Cayman at one time. Sadly, Bob Soto recently passed away or he would have been here for this. 
Bob was at least as passionate as I am about this subject. And I, Bob was the founder of diving in 19, 1957. And I'd asked him, what were the numbers like once of the big parrotfish, the big rainbow parrotfish, midnight parrotfish, the blue parrotfish? These are large fish, two to four feet in length. There's one on the cleaning table. Um, he said it was commonplace to see schools of 40 to 60 at every dive site. Wow, that's almost unimaginable, un unimaginable because when I got here, schools were rare. And the most I ever saw were maybe 10 in a school. Today, these fish are few and far between. This is like a unicorn on the cutting table, right? But, uh, but then I saw this little film clip shot in 1972, just 11 years before I arrived, showing exactly what Bob had described. 40 to 60 uh, large parrotfish, and they're pouring sand out. This is the sand that we have on our beaches. When we lose these fish, we lose our beaches. Now, uh, this change in expectation uh, that occurs between each new generation coming into view a declining population at a different point in its decline is called a shifting baseline. Uh, for each new generation, we're coming in at a different uh, level. For Bob, it was way up here. His normal was lots of fish. He comes in and says, wow, awesome, look at all the fish. But by the 60s, there's a decline occurring. He, he can recognize. By the 70s, it's going so fast. He's screaming, this is unsustainable. We have to stop. And he was absolutely right. But unfortunately, education is slow and uh, politics even slower. So I come in now in 1983. My bar is down here. This is my normal. I didn't know about all that until I heard about it from Bob. And so I come in and I go, wow, awesome. Look at all the fish, right? Shifting baseline. And now I see this rapid decline happening left, right, and center my first week on the island. And, um, and now, by 1986, the Marine Park is established. And I'm celebrating with the choir, you know, yay, salvation. But no, the park was weakened by uh, political compromise that allowed fishing on the entire length of the drop-off, all the way along that uh, deep edge of the reef, right where all the fish go to spawn and the big fish go to feed at dusk. And so the park was almost no park at all. We just fished out all the big fish from our marine park. We thought we had this wonderful thing, and it could be, and we can uh, fix it. But <clears throat> now in the meantime, our decline continues rapidly. Now, 29 years later, the bar's way down here. We're probably less than 10% of what Bob saw when he started diving. New divers come in. Wow, awesome, look at all the fish. Really, they have no clue what's missing. And, uh, and I explain all this to uh, young fishermen today. It's like I'm talking to this. And when I get done, they might say something like, no, man, no, there's plenty of fish. I, I caught 60 squab last weekend. And they just don't get it. You know, they, they're driving nails into the coffin at, at the very end here. We're scraping the bottom of the barrel. Ask any old timer, is fishing as good today as when you were a boy? He'll say something like this. No, sir. No, sir. When I was a boy, you could fill your boat with fish in just a few hours. Today, you can fish all day. Hard to catch one fish this long. I don't know where all the fish went. Okay, you filled your boat with fish and don't know where they went. <laughs> but here's a pretty good idea what happened. Uh, it's, it's really, I don't blame the fishermen for just doing their jobs exceedingly well. You know, they were very good at their jobs. But the real root cause of our problem is our numbers. We went from the island time forgot, less than 9,000 residents, to nearly 60,000 residents today. And tourism went from zero to nearly two million visitors a year. Everybody who visits an island wants to eat fresh local seafood, right? And we've just been excellent hosts. But we need to stop selling our reef fish. This was unsustainable back in the 60s and 70s. Bob was right, he saw we were already declining our population back then. And now we have way more people and way less fish. And here's a good example of just what I'm talking about here. Uh, this is a comparison between reef fish repopulation and a bank account. You probably understand your bank account. Um, if, we, if we had inherited $10 million back in 1950, earning 2% interest per year, you could spend $200,000 every year and stay sustainable, uh, sustainable. That's just using the interest earned, leaving the principal intact. That's how rich folks stay, stay rich, right? Now, if these were fish bucks instead of dollars, um, we would still have a reef packed with fish. 
if we had used it sustainably. But obviously, we, we didn't do that. We ate deeply into the principle. Until today, 2015, we're down somewhere around 100,000 fish bucks left in the bank. And it's still only earning 2% interest per year. And so your interest earned is $2,000 a year. That ain't much. Doesn't take much to spend that or overspend that, especially with our numbers so high and everybody's still wanting to eat reef fish. And we haven't changed our laws yet on how we fish. And, but I have a hope that we can return back to that. That needs to be our goal. Go all the way back to 10 million fish bucks in the, in the bank, and you can still sustainably take 200,000 fish bucks every year, which is more than we have entirely on the reef today. And in fact, actually for certain species, I believe we're less than 1% on the most desirable edible species. Thankfully, Bob Soto gave us a much uh, more lucrative use for our reef fish than just eating them. These fish are worth a whole lot more money left alive on the reef. And Scuba divers are paying about $140 million a year to come diving here right now. Even with a damaged product, they're paying that much to come here. Now, if we continue to damage and wipe out that last little bit that we have left, we could lose that. But turn it around and restore back to what we once had, and we could see huge riches coming into the island. I know from my diving experience that divers go wherever the best photo opportunities are. That's what they want. They see pictures of big fish, pictures of big schools of fish, and that makes them come. Everybody has a camera these days. Well, okay, maybe mostly GoPros, right? But the point is, uh, all this free advertising is being posted online now. We didn't, never had that before. Free advertising, if you have the photo subjects, the photo opportunities. And, but this is what our reef looks like now. This is one of our best dive sites, Ghost Mountain. Kind of ironically named, now that I think about it. At one time, this reef was so packed with, densely packed with big fish, I couldn't have made this photograph without having some big fish in it. But it's not like that anymore. Now you have to hunt and hunt and hunt. Maybe you can find a big fish to get in the picture. Um, but I am confident that if we still had today what we had when I first started diving here, wow, we'd be making at least double, but probably more than quadruple the amount of money we're making right now on diving tourism. I'm talking about hundreds of millions of dollars difference. And we, that's what we've been losing. But I think we can restore that. That's why I'm talking to you. <coughs> we would not only see more divers, we would see higher spending divers too, because the divers with the most money can afford to go anywhere they want to, like where the big fish are. That's what they're doing. All the rich guys are not coming here. They're going somewhere else, like this picture in Tupataha Marine Park in the Philippines. I went halfway around the world to make that picture. I live here, right? We used to have that here, like that. You can't make that picture here now. But I have a dream that we can restore that and do it again. Now, on top of all our over overfishing, there's this new extra burden. This is in addition to what we've already done. The lionfish arrived in 2008. Now, fortunately, we have teams of divers who are making heroic, heroic efforts to try to minimize the impact of this fish on our reef. And uh, you can do your part by eating more lionfish. It's delicious. And you get extra bonus points for eating lionfish instead of demerits. We are like farmers sitting down with the last sack of corn seed. We've already eaten the other 100 sacks. And we're eating out of the last sack of corn seed now, and we're still debating. Are we going to finish eating this sack of seed? Or are we going to plant this for a much greater harvest in the future? This is a no-brainer, right? Everybody in here, nod your head if this is a no-brainer. You know, uh, <clears throat> so failure to invest will end the very cultural tradition that we most cherish and came in. That's a father teaching a son to fish, or in my family, to, <laughs> to photograph fish. We need to cut back in every way we possibly can right now if we want to restore this. And we can do this, but we have to cut back in every way we can so we identify what little kernel that we must preserve for ourselves. And I suggest that's this. So I'm finally to the point. <sighs> Make our reef fish for Caymanian, uh, personal consumption by Caymanians only, right? So how would you do that? I've got an idea. <clears throat> Fishing permits for Caymanians only. That eliminates expats and visitors from catch and keep. They can do catch and release or hook and release, but not catch and keep. Fish by line only. That eliminates fish pots, seine nets, and spear guns, the most destructive forms of fishing on the reef. And then I think most crucial, Set a catch limit 
something reasonable like two to four fish per person per day, which allows us to catch something to eat for dinner, but not enough to sell. Not, and it prevents us, this is I think one of the most crucial aspects, prevents us from overfishing all those other spawning aggregations that are not currently protected. We protect Nassau groupers, but nothing else. We are grossly overfishing everything else. Now, I think everybody can agree that we need more enforcement. Even the fishermen say, you know, you've got to increase enforcement. Absolutely, of course. And uh, give DOE, whatever they need, Department of Environment, whatever they need to truly stop the poaching. Certain species, I think, are so critically endangered. Uh, we need to consider what, uh, what fish we want to give total protection to. And we're not going to do this. We're not going to achieve this with half measures like we took in the 80s. Um, <clears throat> we need to do the hard thing, and we need to do it right now. Uh, but if we do this, we can be the diving mecca once again. And while hundreds of millions of dollars in riches flow into Cayman's economy year after year, sustainably, forever, fathers will be able to teach their sons to catch a few big fish for dinner. And it'll be awesome fishing, because, man, you'll hook up right now when the reef is packed with fish. But we can, we can do this. In the meantime, we can all just do the right thing. Choose to stop buying, catching, selling, eating reef fish. Just stop. You, not, you're, you now know how critical the issue is, how close we are to the end of our reef fish, and how valuable these fish are if we uh, restore them. So just do what you can in, Invite anybody who you can influence to do the same. If they don't get it, show them this talk. Um, our legislators are currently in talks right now with Department of Environment. Right now, they're talking about new regulations. Share your opinion with them before they make decisions that are going to affect the fate of the future. Uh, we need to be fearless in approaching our legislators and let them know that we will vote for legislators that give serious protection to our reef fish, and we will vote against those who reject it. That's what they need to hear, so they can make the right, they need to be fearless too, so they can make the right decision. They need to hear from the voters, get in their ear, lots of numbers. We have to let them know that there's a large constituency out here that are going to vote for this. They're going to, you know, vote your conscience. So imagine how sweet the future will be. If we all do everything we can right now to restore this heritage, we'll be passing on to our children. So I leave you now with my dream of, sorry, one possible future for Cayman as the sea world of the Caribbean. Unlike sea world though, we won't need to lift a finger to maintain it. Just keep your hands off, right? So please share this talk. Thank you very much.